Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask a few more questions, if that's all right, Senator Marshall. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> back in the 90s, um, when there'd be a headline, like once a week, insurance companies' records hacked, made public, or hospital records hacked, made public, or you name it, hacked, made public. And so I asked Joe Tucci, who was the CEO of EMC up in Massachusetts, which was the leading data storage company in the world. Um, Dell has now purchased it. Uh, and I said, uh, what's going on? He says, oh, we could have protected all those companies. We try to sell them our highest end security product, but they just don't want to buy it because it costs them too much money. So they'd rather run the risk of having the data breach. And so I said, so the, the technology is there. The, the counter algorithm is there to fight against, you know, what becomes the state of the art in terms of the, the criminals trying to break in. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's there. But we, we, many companies, or the executives, just don't want to spend that extra money. They're hoping they retire before their company gets hacked so they don't have to explain to the board of directors why they have to spend all that extra money. So it was a big insight to me that, oh, yeah, there's a battle that's going on, good versus evil, but good's in the battle too. It's just, are we going to have it deployed? Are we going to ask that that be just maybe a little extra cost that has to get built into the system to protect against the deleterious aspect of any new technology? It's that challenge, right? Because profits would say, no. You know, look, look at how much we max out if we just deploy this new technology without the additional safeguards, which could be built in. I introduced with Senator Budd, um, Republican on this committee, the Artificial Intelligence and Biosecurity Risk Assessment Act and the Strategy for Public Health Preparedness in Response to Artificial uh, Intelligence Threats Act to direct the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to prepare for AI biosecurity threats. Uh, in your uh, testimony, you noted that President Biden's uh, executive order is an essential step forward for AI oversight, but that there's more to be done. So, Dr. Inglesby, could you just tell us how important it is for Congress to play a role in regulating AI now? Yeah, I'm <clears throat> happy to do that. And I think your your act really um, spoke to that to the importance of that. I think the, the executive order goes a long way in assigning responsibilities to NIST, Department of Energy, Commerce, HHS, but it doesn't require much yet of the companies. I think they're trying to understand the nature of the problem, but I think what your act uh, proposed and what I would also recommend is that, that you get an assessment from HHS, I think is the most logical place. HHS Asper, I think, would have the right expertise to, to give you a stronger sense of what are the risks of the of the creation, AI helping to simplify or accelerate the creation of new very serious biological risks and what could be done, what's, what authorities, if any, are needed to be able to deal with that. I think some are in, in sight now, which are, I think you, Congress should, should be giving uh, audit authority to an agency, whether uh, it's, it's commerce or energy or HHS, around AI risks, but I think such a risk assessment that's done rapidly aimed at congressional leadership, which is a little bit different from what's now in the executive order, I think would be very valuable for leadership here to decide what they might want to do. Yeah, and, and again, that's the goal that Senator Budd and I have, just kind of moving this ball further down the line. And we see it in all kinds of areas, you know, with in the automotive sector, the automotive industry, they wanted to sell you a new car, but they didn't want to have a mandatory seatbelt that was built in. That'll be an extra cost. Not every consumer wants seatbelts. I know my father, the truck driver, he really didn't like seatbelts, so they were saying consumer choice. And then airbags. Well, you know, not every consumer wants an airbag. Yeah, but it's a safety feature. Yeah, but, you know, we'll leave it up to the consumers to do it. So the industries that trying to downsize their safety uh, cost requirements until the consumers get a little bit of a taste of an airbag and a seatbelt, and then they're saying, I'm not going to buy a car that doesn't have safety built in, right, right from the get-go. And so we, we continue to have this conversation that, that uh, coexists with the technological advance 
but then as people catch up, they're going, well, could we have a little more, could we have a child safety cap on top of that medicine? Is that, is that too much of a cost, you know, to please ask you to build that in, you know? And so there's going to be some resistance, but you, you're just trying to balance it. You don't want to take away the good part of it, but you know that there's a sinister side to cyberspace. Um, so can I just come back to you, Dr. Sale? And, and I just heard that um, conversation uh, that uh, Senator Marshall was having about fourth year of medical school, which I'll never know, and uh, my wife knows it as a physician, you know, and uh, <clears throat> and, and uh, she ha keeps her maiden name because she says, I don't remember a Dr. Markey graduating from my graduating uh, <laughs> medical school <laughs> class, so she keeps her own maiden name as Dr. Blumenthal. Um, but um, in your testimony, you spoke about how AI allows you to spend more time with patients by greatly reducing the administrative burden of charting. However, some of the healthcare organizations may look at AI as a means to just cut costs by cutting their workforce. So Dr. Sale, can you speak to how the success of artificial intelligence depends on actual healthcare providers being involved, uh, as you were saying in your conversation with Dr. Marshall? Absolutely, thank you for that. You know, I would echo Sir Marshall's comments earlier, how this is a tool. Right, it's in, in much in line with the EMR. This is a chance for us to optimize our workflows, improve our efficiencies, add information and perform tasks that historically take away from our time with our patients and add value back to our, our encounters so we can work with our patients more closely, listen to our patients and really develop a more um, beneficial relationship with our patients than we can get when we're typing in information into an EMR. So I think uh, there is a tremendous opportunity, I think, to, to continue to utilize this as a tool. I think it's important to, to remind our clinicians that that is what it is and that you still have to play a role in this. Because what, what I fear sometimes is complacency or um, reliance, over-reliance on this tool, right? And so you think about instances where in an EMR we've copy-forwarded an error, right? And so how do we avoid that with this kind of a tool? Because I think it, you know, AI has the potential to propagate errors. So can I just so how should a nurse view this as a threat to her employment or as an augmentation of her ability to help with her patient care? It's a great question. I would say if you were to ask my nurse, she would love to spend less time on the phone doing work that is uh, beneath her level of licensure um, and doing menial tasks and chart review and chart things that, that could be done by AI and rather spend time with the patient doing education and training. So I think most of our nursing staff and our clinicians would relish the opportunity to remove themselves from some of those administrative and documentation tasks that we've become overwhelmed with in our EMR world and instead focus our time and efforts with our patients. So you don't, you don't view it as a threat? I don't really think it's going to replace clinician judgment or patient uh, engagement. I think, if anything, we have a nursing shortage, a physician shortage, an overall healthcare worker shortage uh, that's been existing uh, even pre-pandemic and just exacerbated by the pandemic. So I think that this is, if anything, helps us close some of the gaps that exist in our ability to take care of patients. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Good. Beautiful. So here's what I'm going to do. Finish up one minute apiece for each one of you in reverse order of the original Testimony, the one minute you want the subcommittee to remember as we're moving forward on legislation uh, to deal with uh, AI as it interacts with the healthcare system. We'll begin with you, Ms. Huberty, you have one minute. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think it's important to know that I have been here today to describe the actual patient harm that is in place due to this AI. and sound the alarms for the points where the doctors cannot override the AI and it causes the, that harm, that patient harm. It has a ripple effect through the economy, not only for that person's medical bills, but also the facilities that can't keep up and that can't accept patients anymore either. I think, you know, I'm here to say this is exactly what is happening and this is, we can use this as a model. What can we do with this information now so that it doesn't happen with other, with other AI technology in the future? Great. Dr. Mandel. I'd like to uh, re-emphasize uh, the importance of measurement, uh, the importance of making data available so that we have AI trained on the full diversity of the American population and so that we can monitor AI and its impacts along with uh, boosting uh, tremendously the way we monitor uh, drugs, devices, procedures 
uh, and that we actually create a more efficient healthcare system as a byproduct. That is, that is, a, that is one important focus within this uh, domain. Okay, great, and Dr. Inglesby. Yeah, thank you, Senator. I think I'd just like to close by uh, reemphasizing the enormous potential benefit of AI in, uh, in healthcare, but to, 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 uh, to get the, the full benefit of, of AI in, in healthcare and in public health, we need to now, at the start of this, this huge change, to uh, address the risks not only of privacy, bias, data integrity, um, and beyond, but also focus on the, the very high-end risks around AI and the biological sciences. I think a number of ideas and steps are already on the table, but Congress can go further uh, with some immediate steps and with, with uh, more information from the agencies. Thanks very much. And Dr. Sale, you have the final word. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, this has been an honor and a, and a pleasure to be here. I would say, I, while I acknowledge the large scale and big picture concerns around AI, I feel like there may be some small window opportunities for us to utilize this technology in ways that really help improve patient care, physician and practice practitioner well-being, and can really actually improve our outcomes in healthcare with mitigating that risk. I think that requires close collaboration with our physicians and our clinical workforce as we develop these tools and define their uses of application within healthcare. I think it encompasses mitigating risk with privacy and security of data. Uh, and I think ultimately, with the goal in mind of improved patient care, and avoiding physician and clinician replacement, but rather enhancement of the practice of medicine. Beautiful, thank you so much. And uh, like Dr. Naismith, you have served the state of Kansas very well. So we, uh, we thank you for your testimony. Although the best basketball player in the world right now plays for the Denver Nuggets for Senator Hickenlooper's home team. Uh, and, potentially, uh, potentially. Uh, I, I think it's an evidence-based determination I'm okay. making on that. Uh, and, and uh, and artificial intelligence too. <laughs> Until, and, until that young man from uh, Webiana down in San Antonio, he might quickly change the algorithm. Yeah. <laughs> so we thank everyone who participated today, especially our witnesses who traveled here from Massachusetts, Kansas, Wisconsin, and Maryland. Your perspectives are essential for ensuring that we guard against the harms of artificial intelligence. We need to put people over profit, prioritize worker voices, and keep focused on how to best treat patients. So I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record uh, a statement from stakeholders uh, outlining priorities for addressing AI in healthcare without objection. And for any senators who wish to ask additional questions of our witnesses for the record, uh, they will be due in 10 days, uh, November 22nd, 2023 at 5 p.m. Uh, and uh, we thank everyone. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.